بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل وعلى لبيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذين ذهب الله عنهم ورجسا وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اما بعد قال الله الحكيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فسبحان الذي بيده ملكوت كل شيء وإليه ترجعون سبق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد A series of discussions have gone into his third night It's sad that these nights are slowly, slowly going Already what seems to have started is now three nights in. This is the haqiq of life. Life is such that it leaves us, slowly but surely. When you're younger, a day seems very long. As you grow older, you find time begins to go like quicksand. If you look at Nabi Nuh alayhi salam, similarly to Nabi Ibrahim, when the angel came to him and said, it's time for you to go. Having lived over a thousand years, when he asked how life was, he said it's like moving from one place into a shade. Your entire life is like that. It's transient. It's going. And eventually a time is going to come. You've seen already, in the last year or two years, how many people have died. How many people have left us. Perhaps it may not be the case too much in North America or Scotland but at least in England in London I remember a time where there were four janazas a day which were coming in those people who were giving ghusl were tired they were crying they couldn't take it there's certain centers in London today that there's only one elder left the entire back row is gone that tells you how transient life is this is life and death is a reality that is a haqiqa. Even the greatest of all men, awliya of Allah, came, they went. Death doesn't stop for the Prophet. Death doesn't stop for a middle mu'mineen. It isn't something that's going to stop for me and you. So really, in this short span, and when you ask about the haqiqa of life, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, your man, it's two days. One day is with you. When it's with you, it gives you all of those qualities you don't even have. You notice, right? You get boosted to the moon. And one day, it's against you. And when that happens, you'll see it. People will strip even the good qualities of you. They'll make you out to be the worst human being on earth. How do you balance yourself between two extremes? On the one hand, when somebody raises you. On the one hand, when somebody takes you to ground level zero. How do you balance yourself? one way just remember your responsibility remember who you are remember your responsibility remember the purpose of your life how do we know what it is look the last two days we've been developing a discussion we haven't come through the introduction yet so today i'm going to try in this section to finish an introduction which i should have done in the first night where does this start off from this discussion really starts off at the very beginning. When? When Allah created Adam. What is Adam? Adam equals humanity. He may be one person, but Adam actually is 7 billion people living on this earth. It's one body. So the story of Adam is actually the story of humanity. And what does Allah say? Allah, as you know, says, when I blow a part of my soul, or part of my ruh into Adam wa nafaqta fihim al ruhi, then what? All of you go into sajda. The story is in front of you. There are two dialogues that take place on the creation of Adam. 
one between Allah and the angels, one between shaitan and Allah. Both of these dialogues are telling as to what humanity is. It's important, therefore, for you to ponder over the Qur'an. Look, today, you know the biggest mistake that Muslims make? Those who read the Qur'an happen to read it by mistake. Read it like a parrot. They don't go into detail as to what the meaning is. And then there's some people who just don't even touch it. Your Qur'an is there, you put it on your head. You kiss it when you're getting married. Your daughter's going, you put it on her head. Somebody's being buried, you might bring the Qur'an, you open it up. And that's about it. It comes out on weddings. It comes when you have a majlis. Maybe in Ramadan if you're lucky. And then after that it goes nicely on your shelf. And inshallah within six months there will be at least two inches of dirt. That is the Qur'an. Not realizing that Qur'an is the kalam of Allah. That Qur'an is a miracle. You've got a miracle in your home. Honestly, if you were to give me the Qur'an right now, it's not next to me. If it was, I would have shown you. That any page that I open up, I can tell you in that which ayah is for what in terms of ailments of your body. I'm naqis, I'm nothing. Imagine those people who have ilm of the Qur'an, what they're capable of. Ilm of the Qur'an. Open up the Qur'an anywhere. Let's say, I don't remember, let's do this. Open up the Qur'an, first chapter. First chapter of the Qur'an, recited a particular amount of times a day, for 40 days, or even for 40 days for an average person, but if you become amil of that, within a day, within one Surah Fatiha, it's enough for you to cure yourself. Go into the second chapter, Baqarah. There's verses in there for risk. There's verses in there for marriage. There's verses in there for health. There's verses in there for protection. There's verses in there to protect you from the evil eye. There's verses in there, for example, to protect you from black magic and jinn, etc. Go to the next chapter, for argument's sake. After that, what do you find? People who can't have children. There's verses in there for that. Keep on going on. Yasin comes along. Open up Yasin. There's a verse in Yasin. If a person's born blind, they recite it at particular times, Allah will cure their eyesight, for argument's sake. In, the, in this Qur'an of yours, that has no negative byproduct. If you were reading this Qur'an on a daily basis, nur would develop into your heart. That Qur'an, what do you do? You put it on your shelf and dirt begins to gather. I say dirt, but leftover cells, whatever it is, your hoover doesn't get there, so then it begins to pile up. Not realizing that's a miracle. Go today and see. On a weekly basis, you'll find Bible classes. People sit there, they read the Bible, they analyze the Bible. Go to scriptural reasoning or textual reasoning that the Jews do. They'll sit down with each other and they'll have a discussion on verses of the Torah. Now look at Muslims. Today, what do we do? And then we put it away. And if somebody does, they recite it like a parrot. It's good, recite it like a parrot. I'm not against that. What I'm saying, though, is at least once a week, once a month, you have Thursday night programs, you have Tuesday night programs. For once, bring a Qur'an, let's have a discussion on a verse. Let's have a discussion. It should, look at the tafasir we have. Look at the ahadith that we have. You've got the ilm of Ahlul Bayt, which again is stored in your wardrobes. If you were to take that out and look at it, contrast it with the Qur'an, Secrets are all there. I'm only talking about shifa as the Qur'an. But look, the biggest shifa is the qalb. How the Qur'an purifies your heart. You know there's certain chapters in the Qur'an. For example, maybe I shouldn't be given this example. The secret of Tayyal Ard rests in certain verses of Surah Taha and certain verses of the final chapters of the Qur'an. I would say, even if I do, you wouldn't be able to without ijazah. So Surah Tawheed. The secret of Tayyil Adr lies in Surah Tawheed. How many times, what to do? Again, it needs a Even if I was to say it to you, I would have to have a to give you a Otherwise, it's detrimental. And I'll give you a story now on that. You know, we mentioned, it's coming into mind, so I might as well give it to you. We were mentioned Allama Hafiz Ziyan. Allama Hafiz Ziyan's first teacher was a guy by the name of Nukodiki Isfahani, the famous mystic, right? For those people who are Mashadi, you'll know. Whenever there's an issue, you go to the books, take an amal of Nukhodik Esfahani, you recite it, and it's hal. Now, there was a person by the name of Sayyid Ali Radawi. 
he goes up to Nukodek Yisrahani. He says, Sheikh, you know, I'd like to have a du'a. Sheikh didn't say anything, but it was a du'a written there. So he goes, he takes it. What does it say? Tayyil Ard. This guy decides, he said, look, I don't know who this Sayyid Ali Razo is, by the way. But anyhow, he goes and he says, look, this is a du'a of Tayyil Ard. Right. What is Tayyil Ard? Go to the Quran and see. On a serious note, what is Tayyil Ard? Tayyil Ard is what Asif does in the time of Sulaiman. Quran says he has a small knowledge of the Quran. What does he do? He says, before you can blink, I can bring the throne of Bilqis. You know how that works? It works like this, that Allah compresses the land for you. Compression of the land takes place, you make a step and you're there. They say that there were many scholars who were able to do this once upon a time. And then it goes less and less and less. Today, how many people are famous for that? Allah knows. But there are always 30 people in the world who are capable of this. Minimum. But there are other people as well who can do that. But anyhow, without going into further detail, Sayyid Ali Raza, we decides, he goes into the jungle, right? And he takes it, and from the jungle, then he says, you know, should I do Amal? He says, no, no, let's, let's go to my home. So he goes into the house. He sits down, he wears white, because some of the Amal you have to wear white. It's got white on, so he hasn't got his Aba on, nothing. It's just white that he wears. And every day there was a select amount of times that you have to do it in a particular order. In that process, the first thing that you have to do is that you have to negate before you affirm. And what happens is that a negation, why? Because mawakilat come and sometimes jinn come as well. Certain amal, this is why you need ijazah. Because certain times you will be disturbed by mawakilat, certain times with jinn. These aren't discussions we should have on the member generally. But there's a place where I want to take you. Because sometimes knowledge, at least so you know for your own information, what it is, why. When certain ulama say, I can't give this to you. And you're pestering and you're saying, please give it to me, please give it to me. It's not about that. It's about ijazah. This, this is an entire silsil itself. In the same way that you have ijtihad, where your teacher writes down a sanad for you to say you're a mujtahid, though technically you don't need a sanad of a teacher. But for people, yes, you get that written down. So traditionally in the Hausa, there's an entire books which have been written on, you actually don't need a sanad, right? If you think you're a mujtahid, you could justify it between you and Allah. But yes, people get sanad, right? That's how it works. There are many who didn't, but the many who did afterwards. Some of them became mujtahids, they didn't, they would go to their teachers and they would get it. Fine. And similarly, within the wadi of Amalia, Ulum al Gariba and Irfan, remember the two different things. Don't ever confuse these two wadis, right? These valleys. The value of Ulum al Gariba is different. The value of Irfan is different. The purpose of Irfan is to get to Allah, not to solve people's problems. 99% of people who come to you asking for an Amal, they have an issue. That is an Irfan. That goes back to the occult. Solving problems. When you ask for an Amal from an Ustad, of Irfan, that is purely to get to God, not to resolve your issues. And the reason being is this, because the Arif Salik who is going towards Allah, remember this, is doing it for the sake of Allah, so he walks on the Mashiach of Allah. He doesn't care what problem befalls him. He believes that Allah will take him through that. But when a person goes and he says, Sheikh, can you give me an Amal for Tayyil Ard, or for example, goes forward and he says, can you give me something, argument's sake, I can't have any children, I want risk, health problems. All of these issues, nothing to do with Irfan in that particular way. Okay, it's names of Allah, it's good. Resolve your issues, recite these things because Quran is a Shifa and what better to remember the names of Allah. But the reality is that really has nothing to do with the status of Ma'rifah in that respect. Yes, it has a level because obviously you need Ma'rifah to cure yourself. But a person who performs miracles is not the Milak for somebody who's an Arif. There have been scholars in the past who perform multiple different karamat. But would you turn around and say that they're, for example, at the highest level of Irfan? It doesn't necessarily mean that. So remember, there's two types of people. The vast majority, when they come for an amal, it isn't the fact that they're interested in Irfan. The fact is, is they want to resolve their issues. And there's no problem with that, by the way. But remember, when a person says to you, hang on a minute, this needs ijazah. Remember, certain things are very strict. Certain things are easier, but certain things require... The higher the thing is, the higher the gamble is, the more the pitfalls are. If you think this world is difficult, when you start your spiritual journey, you have to go through awamils. 
you have to go through one by one different alams. And when that happens, alam and malakut is much more difficult than this world, believe me. When you go through alam and barzakh, alam and mithal, it becomes very difficult. It's not easy. And this is why ulama always had prescriptions to nullify what they would call as awarid, negativity. They're nullified because it does happen. It comes, because there's a side effect, there's a reaction. And that teacher who would give it sometimes would say, for example, said Murtaba Kashmiri, the great. So you got said Murtaba Kashmiri here, his great grandfather. So Atullah Sistani's son in law, his great grandfather was the famous Allama Kashmiri, the one who came from India. When he came from India to, at the time there was no Pakistan, so he came from Kashmir, from India. He came to, at the time, Karbala. And he became one of the famous teachers of Irfan. Nukhode Kisfahani was his teacher, by the way, his uh, student, by the way. Many people studied under him. Now, when he first came, and one of the karamat of this person is this. When he came, people doubted him. They said, you've come from India, surely you can't be Sayyid. He got upset. He went crying to Imam al-Rada, alayhi salam. Why? Because the Kashmiri Sadata, Razawiyun. So they went. And he was a very simple person. Remember one thing. Allah likes simplicity. He goes up. He says, Mola, these people are taking the mick out of me. Because I've come from a faraway land. He went to sleep. When he woke up under his bed was the entire shajara stamped by Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. Simple person. But he became the teacher of so many in this wadi. He himself, sometimes when he gave an amal, he would say, stop it. To his, he goes, this is not compatible. Something may happen. So it's not an easy pathway. But at the same time, it's just a fulfilling pathway. Those people are going towards Allah. This is why there's a difference. You never saw Sheikh Bahjad go into these issues whereby do, he would just say one thing to you. You had an issue? Ja'far. Ja'far meaning, go and pray. Ja'far at tayyar you got an issue, go and recite salawat. You go, remember, what the, the person giving it to you is also powerful. If the person giving it to you is a mega vault, he could give you bismillah and you'll walk over water. If a person is who's giving it to his naqis, it's not going to work as effectively. Why? Because the amil, the one who gives it to you, also must have gone through the entire route. This is why we go to the door of Ahlul Bayt. They've been to the end and they've come back from the end. This is why it's important to go to the door and nobody else's. We don't go to peers and murshids and all these people. We go directly to the door of Imam Hussein. We have an issue. We recite the tasbih of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. We have an issue, we recite salawat. We have an issue, we recite istighfar, right? And we'll come on to why that's important. We have an issue, we recite da'i tawassul, both mashur that you do on a Tuesday night, but in the words of Ibn Ta'us, the tawassul of Khaja Nasir al-Din al-Tusi. It's these miracles that happen with that tawassul. It's long, it's long. But miracles happen with that. You have an issue, you recite Josh Kabir. You have an issue, you go to your fourth Imam, Imam Sajjad's Dua book. In that there's secrets in there. There's secrets in there. If I was to go through at least three of those, I would tell you if I was at the permission, that or if I, which ones they recite. I won't say who recites what, but I'll indicate two. Dua 7, Dua 13. Make it your word. Nothing will touch you. Believe me. Now that he's passed away, Ayatollah Bahjid himself would recite number seven. Every single day. If a man like that is reciting it, who are we not to recite it? Why? You know what you have? You have a treasure trove. Do you know why I emphasize for you to recite the Dua of the Imam? Why did we mention yesterday? Why did I say recite Ziyata Jamai Kabira for? 
because this maktab is the only maktab in Islam where your Imam teaches you how to speak to Allah. No other maktab is there which gives you the ability to speak to Allah. The most important thing is Tawheed. There aren't enough du'as of the Prophet, right? There aren't because obviously he was mahdud in this world. If you go to the literature of our brothers, there are very few du'as. Very few. Compared to us, it's only 2%. Take all of the du'as that they have. Look at all of the du'as which we have. How do you know how a ma'asum speaks to Allah? Quran is the kalam of Allah, so it doesn't tell you how to speak to him. But when you look at Amir al muminin reciting du'a kumail, you come to realize how a master speaks to the creator. When you look at Imam Sajjad and you look at his du'a, when you look at Abu Hamza Thamali, the du'a, when you look at some, these are du'as, Ziyarat al-Jami Kabir teaches you how to speak to Allah. People say, well, you know, where's the Tawheed? This is the Tawheed, it's Aina Tawheed. How does Imam begin? Allahumma in yas'aluka bi rahmatika allati wasa'at kulla shay. That's how he begins. He's teaching you, whenever you speak to Allah, Remind Allah, you are Allah whose mercy encompasses all of creation. How do you speak to God? This is why we go to the du'as of the Imams. I'm not saying for you to go just for the sake of going. Read this du'a with meaning you'll see. Why are you going to the Imam for? The reason being is Imam is Baba Rahma. He teaches you how to do conversations with Allah. The nations before had the Psalms of Dawood. They put it on their head. You've got the Psalms of Sajjad and you put it next to your feet. What have you got? The main purpose of study, and then this is another issue. The main purpose of a person studying, the end goal is not just to be a mujtahid in Taharat and Najasat. In essence, nobody cares if you know all the ahkam of how to do ghusl. If you can prove it, that's good for you. And it's a good thing. That's not the goal though. The purpose of knowing the ahkam of ghusl is to get to Allah. Don't ever lose the goal. Many a time when our children, when they go into Hausa, I remind them one thing. Don't get mixed up in running around just looking at that. It's important. Yes, it is. We all studied it. It's important. The end goal isn't that. The end goal is Allah. Wudu is a medium. Salah is a medium. You have to know it. You have to learn it. You have to. It's not the end goal though. End goal is Allah. Remember that. And to go to Allah requires humility. Requires humility. Humility means what? In the olden days, in Najaf and Qum, ulama would never comment on another alim. They would keep their mouth closed when it came to anybody else. Why? Because Adab and Adab doesn't necessitate that. You've got to live, right? If I need to show you how you should behave, then I should be trying my best to behave as well in that particular way. When somebody came to Atullah Khoi, he said to him, what do you think about so-and-so alim? Is he a mujtahid? Like, people ask these questions, but look at how a master replies. And he goes, I don't know. I said, what do you mean? He goes, he wasn't my student. And I've never done Mubaitha with him. And I've never had a discussion with him, so I don't know. But obviously, most probably he didn't know. He's not lying either, because he's given the condition. He's left room that maybe I may be wrong, or I may be right, for argument's sake. And what do we do today? You've not studied with the person. You've not discussed things with the person. You don't know anything about the person, but you made a statement against him. Ya Allah, it's akhlaq. You need to get to Allah. Somebody comes to me, tells me, you know this chap sitting here, he's so and so. I straight away, he must be a really bad person. Ya Allah. Hussein is for Hussein knows what hur is. You haven't seen with your own eyes what that person is doing. And let's say even if he was doing something bad. Hadith says you've got seven hours to repent. Within seven hours, the malaika don't write it. Allah says, freeze. This is why if ever your fajr is qadha, read it within seven hours of it becoming qadha. Malaika don't write it. Repent to Allah and fulfill it. Read it. If anything ever happens, 
if you've sinned, remember what the Imam says. He says, my Shias are not Masum. They will sin. They will sin. But my Shia are those people who repent immediately. Our biggest downfall is this. This is what destroys us. But look, I go on a tangent. But all this is important. Let me bring it all the way back again to the point that I wanted to raise. Said Ali, Razawi. Story goes up back again towards him. Why do I mention him? So anyhow he goes. He messed up on one of the days, maybe day 21 or 22. He wasn't able to remove the awara to begin with, to enter. You know what he says? He says, when I looked up, I saw a huge guy come. I got scared. He grabbed me by the head and I went unconscious. When I woke up, I realized I was in some kind of a desert. I didn't know where I was and I was in my white clothes, meaning I was in my home clothes. So I said to myself, I hope I'm not in Japan or somewhere else because I'm going to have a huge problem. Luckily enough, he says, I went onto the road and I saw a friend of mine and I realized, hang on a minute, I'm in another city, but luckily I'm not in another country. So he looks up and he goes, Sayyid, what's happened here? Why are you still in your white pants and white shirt for? He says, don't ask me, man, just take me back to home. So he went back. He says, I never did the Amal again. He goes, no way. So he asked him, did you finish that Amal of Taylor? He says, no, 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 I'm, I don't even want to touch that. It's difficult. But who's Alama Hafiz Yan? The one who Nukodeki himself says, I've taught you everything that I know. I can't go any further than this. That's who Hafiz Yan is. That's who Hafiz Yan is. So look, the point in all of this is that there are guides and you'll see them and you'll find them. But all of them go back to one thing. They go back to the wilaya of Ahlul Bayt. Now coming back to the very first thing that I said. Adam, two things. Allah's conversation with shaitan, Allah's conversation with the angels. What is Adam? Adam is the sum of the entire humanity. What is shaitan? Shaitan shows the worst in humanity. Let's start off on shaitan, then we'll come to the angels. Who is shaitan going against? What does shaitan say? Shaitan says to Allah, I'm not going to bow to this made out of clay. He wasn't just indicating Adam, he was indicating mankind until the day of judgment. If you look at the words, it's not just an indication on Adam, it's an indication on human beings. That for me to bow down to this made out until the day of judgment. Who's he going against? People say, well, he was going against Nabuwa. Actually, he wasn't just going against Nabuwa. Yes, he believed in Allah. But actually what he was doing was tajawuz against Allah himself. Why? Because within Adam rested the wilaya. He was waliullah, rested wilaya. He was sahib amr. And Allah says that what is ruh? Min amr rabbi. Everyone's ruh is amr rabbi. But this sahib amr, who's waliullah, is the hujjat of Allah on the time. Your ruh is controlled by somebody else. And that person's name is Hujjat ibn al-Hassan. This is why what Muharram does is it connects your heart to the Hujjah. In the words of the ulama, sometimes when you wake up in the morning, you feel upset. You don't know why you're feeling upset, but you feel upset. They say it's because the Hujjah is upset. And there's times when you feel happy and you don't know why. That's because your imam's happy. There's a connection of the heart. And this is that connection that brings Habib ibn Mawahir to Karbala. This is that connection where Awais Saqarani in Yemen hasn't seen the Prophet, but he's looking at the Prophet. This is that connection that you find Malik al-Ashtar far away from Kufa is given honey that is poisoned. And he sits there and his wife says, Malik, when we got married, I asked you what ishq was, what love was. You never answered. Today I've got the answer. Your hours are up numbered, but all I can see is that you're intoxicated in the will of Ali. He says, what can I do? I can hear the cryings of my mola in Masjid al-Kufa. 
as he stands there at night time and he says Mawla Yahya Mawla what is Ali teaching? Tawheed what is Hussein teaching? Tawheed what does Shaitan do? Shaitan didn't submit himself you see Allah's not teaching shirk here so look if you look at it right some Muslims say this is shirk this is shirk in which case this entire story is shirk is Allah really asking for somebody to bow down to Allah? or is it submission of the soul to the will of insani kamil remember the markas of the angels the Kaaba of the angels the qibla of the angels Adam why is he the qibla of the angels when there was no ruh in him what was it nothing when something was blown in and our tradition says what was blown was the haqiqat muhammad nur muhammadi that is the absolute manifestation madhhar of wilaya what allah wanted from the angels and shaitan submit yourself to that wilaya what did he do he didn't until the day of judgment anyone who does not submit themselves to that wilaya is shaitan allah's dialogue begins but look how merciful Allah is. What does shaitan say? What would you say if you had a fight with somebody? He said, get out of my sight. I don't want to see you again. If shaitan had done that, no problem. But shaitan doesn't do that. He says, okay, you want to kick me out? But what I want to do is I want to make sure that from the right and the left and the front, all six directions, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to make the life of this Adam hell. So the tradition of Adam says, Allah, this guy, there's two of them for me. Every person who's born, there's two shaitans who are born. He goes, what do I do? Allah says, don't worry. He's going to whisper in your ear, right? I'm going to do something for you as well. If you have a haram thought in your mind, I won't write it down. When you implement it, I'll make it one sin. And I'll give you seven hours to repent. And you know what else? When you think of a good thing, I'll write it down as good. And when you enact it, I'll give you two good rewards. Allah says, don't worry, I'm merciful. But at the same time, what else did Allah do? He put somebody on earth who will always be there to teach you the mercy of Allah so that you never lose hope in Allah. Why is it today Muslims only look at the wrath of Allah? Allah Doesn't Allah say, my mercy encompasses even my wrath? We're so strict. No. You guide people with love. Love is important. So what happens here? Look, look at the story. Let's slowly go on. There's a place I want to take you guys to. What else does it say? Say Adam, Shaitan. We all know what Shaitan symbolizes. Now come to the angels. What does the angels say? They say, Allah, you're going to create something on earth that's going to create bloodshed and is going to create facade, mufsid. The mufsid fil ard, this person, you're going to what does Allah says? In the alamu, mala ta'alamun. I know what you don't know. Now, surely the angels have insulted God by questioning Him, right? Angels didn't realize. Now, that's another issue: who the angels were, because there's more than one type of angel. There's those angels which are other the angels. There's those angels with Jabaruti. So many ulama say this wasn't Jibrail and Mikhail. These were the angels on the earth. Those angels that help in creation. They want the archangels. But anyhow, whatever the discussion is, that's not my issue. My issue is this. What do the angels say? The angels say, Allah, we do you tasbih. We do taqdis. Right? There's multiple times. Of, let me explain this before I go any further. There's multiple times of dhikr. Angels say, we do tasbih of your hamd, right? We praise you. We do tasbih. Taqdis is to glorify God. So, for example, when you say Allah's quddus is holy. You holify. You glorify God. So, there's two types. Taqdis is Af'ali, Tawheed Af'ali goes back to. Tasbih goes back to Tawheed Adhati. The angels are therefore saying that we do your Tasbih. If they're doing Tasbih of Tawheed Adhati, it means they're on a Maqam. But even then, after all of this, they can't understand Insani Kamil. They don't come to realize Adam is Insani Kamil. They can't identify Sahib Wilaya. But at the same time, because they do Tasbih, and taqdis, what happens? They humble themselves in front of Adam when Allah tells them. So what does Allah say in the Quran? Wa'allama Adama 
Asmaqullaha. I told them all the names. Angels were reciting the names. Tasbih of Allah. Remember, it's the names. How do you come to know God? You can't physically see Him. It's the names of God that connect us to God because the names are the description. Have you ever understood why the Orafa recite a particular name? For example, if you're angry and you want to become merciful, you recite Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahman. Why? Because it encapsulates mercy. A person who's having difficulty in their marital life, they recite Ya Wadud, Ya Wadud, because it increases love. Every name has an impact. Sometimes reciting the wrong name can disbalance you because they're like vitamins or vitamins, as one would say in North America. It's a balance. So you have vitamins for what purpose? To balance your internal faculties. In the same way, every dhikr has a balance. Angels were reciting it, but they didn't have the grand name, which was what? The name of the self. What does Adam teach him? Adam teaches him their name. What is it? The name of the nafs. Why? Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Man arafa nafsuhu faqad arafa rabbuhu. What does Amir al-Mu'mineen talk about nafs for? Because the nafs in and of itself houses a particular name of God that helps you to bridge you and Allah. You and Rabb. You and your Khaliq. Adam teaches the angels those names that bridge them as well. This is what insan Kamil does. He takes you by the hand and with love takes you towards Allah. Remember that. Now coming back. Now coming back to the main point. Time is flying. You know, our time is flying. I wish we had more time to discuss this. Because it's an interesting topic. But look. Coming back to what we said yesterday. Maqam of Salawat. Shall I tell you something? I want you to look at it and see. If you want to increase your wilaya and in understand insani kamil, waliullah, sahib wilaya, how do you understand? What does Allah say? He says this, Inna Allaha wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuha alladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslimat. Your Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, Sallu alayhi symbolizes the zahir, where taslima symbolizes the batin. Two things. One, you have to recite it on the lips. Recite salawat. It's important. Why? Increases your wilaya. But what that salawat does in your batin is that it makes you submit taslim in front of insan kamil. If you cannot put your knees down in front of insan kamil, nothing works. Let me give you a story, therefore. Allama Majlisi, Majlisi Awwal, the father of Allama Majlisi, Sahib Bihar. He says that I went into the Haram of Amir al Mu'mineen. When I went in there, for some reason, I was inspired to read loudly like a Maddah reads Ziyarat al Kabir. He says, I began and I started to write, recite it. He says, Baini Yaqta wa Nom, between awake and asleep as I was reciting it I saw in front of me that a man comes towards me I knew straight away this is the master of the times I get worried my hands and feet start shaking I don't know what to do he says I wanted to sit down I didn't know whether to sit down on my knees cross my knees what to do my mola was merciful he says relax your zahir of my chat. Relax, don't worry. Then he looks up and he says, How beautiful a ziyara you're reciting. There's a ni'mah in this ziyara. Continue to recite it. When a ma'asum says that this ziyara has a ni'mah in it, you know what ni'mah is? Aulad, ni'mah. House, ni'mah. Car, ni'mah. Health, ni'mah. What does Imam say? Ziyara to Jamak, ni'mah. And it's the best of ni'mah. Honestly, if you get an opportunity, at least once a month recite it. Once a month, re why? Ni'ma. Why are you coming and asking, is there a dhikr because we have a financial difficulty? Yes, there is. Zarat al Kabir, go and recite it. See how the Imam addresses Allah. Like, it's all there, honestly. Sometimes you look at it and you think, why didn't I see this before? You know why? Because we need Insani Kamil's Ruwayat to teach us. Otherwise, all of Islam is obvious. 
In fact, all of humanity is it's right in front of you. We miss it. Every single day you see it, but you miss it. Why do you miss it? Because it requires a heart which is open to see it. Otherwise, Allah puts hujab in front of you, so you can't see it. Shall I give you an example? Give you an example. You know the relationship between Umar ibn Sa'd and Imam Hussein? As children, now I'm not going to say they played with one another because that would be insulting to an Imam. But they were in the same area where they would meet each other. So Umar ibn Sa'd knew the Imam. On the 9th of Muharram, Imam Hussein had a private meeting with Umar ibn Sa'd. Umar ibn Sa'd kicked everybody out. Imam Hussein went to his tent. Kicked everybody out, other than his son and Umar ibn Sa'd. Imam Hussein went with two people, Abu Fadl Abbas and Ali Akbar. Both of them, or three of them, came into the tent. Imam Hussein says to Umar ibn Sa'd, he says, you know my relationship with Rasulullah. What you're doing is that you're opening the door of fire to yourself. He says, but Hussein, if I don't fight you, Yazid will kill my wife and children. He looks up and he says, I promise you, they won't be touched. He says, but look, the financial benefits outweigh everything. He says, I want the, bar, the wheat of Ray. Imam Hussein says, you'll never get it. Umar Saad jokes with the Imam. He says, okay, if I don't get the wheat, at least I'll have the barley. The Imam looks up, he says, it's not within your nasib. Every angle that Umar ibn Sa'ad replied to the Imam, Imam had a counter reply. Eventually got to the stage where Hujjatullah has done the Hujjah. Imam Hussein's not there because he's scared of death. Imam Hussein's purpose as an Imam is to guide people. Your personal emotions don't come into it. It is about taking somebody towards Allah. It got to a stage where Imam Hussein knew, Khatam Allah ala qulubihim. This verse of the Quran comes into action. His heart's sealed. What happens? Events of Karbala takes place. Where does Umar ibn Sa'ad go? He goes directly to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Now Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad was in his 20s. He wasn't an old person by the way. He's a young man. He goes to him and he says, I want Ray now. He says, what? He goes, I want Ray. He says, do you have the document that I asked you to kill Imam Hussein? And all he goes, yeah, bring it to me. Umar ibn Sa'ad took it. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad ripped it up. He says, I don't want even anyone to know that I ordered he looks up and he goes, you yourself, Umar ibn Sa'ad, said, there's no one greater on this earth than Hussein. If you can kill him, then proverbially get lost, basically. Move on. He said he came out with tears in his eyes. He says, Hussein said so. What did I do? Why on me? Why did I do this? For what? For something which is perishable? What's the lesson in this? Shall I tell you the lesson? The lesson is this. Love of the world can sometimes take you away from wilay and waliullah. Sometimes it can be love of children. <coughs> Abdullah bin Zubair had a son, Zubair, Zubair had a son, Abdullah. What does Imam say? Zubair was from us, his son took him away. It can be awlad. Allah can test you with awlad. Allah can test you with the risk. Allah multiple different things the first stage is detachment what does salwat mean the batin is taslim to who in sana kamil it's not easy learn to condition yourself to detach yourself to know this world is transient honestly it's like it's like salty water the more that you drink the thirsty you get honestly you could have all the money in the world, it doesn't help you. Speak to those people who are extremely rich. Does, has it given them satisfaction? Had it given them satisfaction, they wouldn't be coming to ulama asking for du'as. Okay, son, you made a billion, what do you want? Maulana, I don't have any children. Maulana, my wife is depressed. I'm depressed. I can't sleep at night time without. Has money given? No. Then you've got that guy sleeping. I'm not saying money is a bad thing, by the way. The rich people who are content, but they're content not because of the richness. 
As one businessman once said to me, he goes, there was once a man so poor, all he had was money. And that is the haqiq of life. What makes you ghani? Al Muhammad. Muhammad and Al Muhammad. So therefore, you want to cash it in? Continue to recite salawat. And you'll see that Allah will fill your heart. Look, our discussion has come to an end. There's a lot I wanted to say. What I planned to say is not what came out today. Sometimes a discussion goes into a particular direction. Our belief is this, that when it does that, there's a reason for that. But look, Asal Haqiqa that we gather here, as you know, is to mourn over Imam Hussein. The most important thing in mourning is humility. If you ever go to Karbala, you see people walking on their knees and their elbows. Absolute sign of humility and brokenness. That humility is important. You know, today I'm going to say to you one thing. Even before I begin. Today, the second of Muharram disappeared. In fact, today we're here effectively to discuss what? Second of Muharram is coming. Second of Muharram symbolizes Imam Hussein's journey when he reaches Karbala. For one second, I want you to go on this journey with Imam Hussein. Just close your eyes. For all of you who've been to Karbala, you know when you go in Arbain from Najaf to Karbala, when you walk in and you see the dome of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and Imam Hussein, what goes through your heart? Three days of walking, your feet are blistered, your tongue is dry, you're feeling pain in your legs. You go there, you say, Mola, I've come from far away. I've been traveling from the other side of the world, only for the sake of your ishq. When you get there, you're careful. You kiss the soil of Karbala, but then you look up and you think, maybe Ali Asghar's blood fell over here. And maybe Qasim's body was shredded over here. And then as you walk closer, you see one maqam, and you notice that's where Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas's right arm is. You look at another maqam, you see Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas is sick. There's certain maqamat which are so painful. You know, one of them is when you go to Khayma Ga, right? When you know that you know that Sakina was sitting here crying. You go and you see, you think that Rabab for the last time was kissing her son over here. There's almost a sadness that really makes your heart hollow when you go there. It rips your heart out. Why? Because all of you are sahib awlad And if you don't have awlad but then again, you have insania, you have humanity in you. Karbala is that place which rips you apart. Allah give everyone the opportunity to go to Karbala at least once in their life. You know, I wish I had the energy to narrate. Sayyid al-Shuhada comes to a land, they say. Say the Zainab comes to him and says, Brother, my heart is unsettled here. I can smell your blood in the soil. Say the Shuhada gets down, lifts up the Khaq of Karbala, puts it next to his nose. What does he say? He says, Are there any inhabitants here? Some people come. He says, What's the name? Eventually comes to a name Karbin Wabala. This is the land of Karb, is the land of pain. And Bala, even more pain. Karbin wa Bala. He says, Abbas, put the tents here. Why? We're here on our final abode. Goes to Bani Asad. He says, How much do you want for this land? Some traditions say 18, 20,000 dirhams. He pays them double, gives it to them. He says, Now that I've taken it, let me give it back to you. 
He says, Mola, but you've given, you've taken it from her. You've given the money. Why? You no, I'm going to give it back to you. He says, but I'm going to give it back to you on three conditions. Three conditions. You know what those conditions were? <laughs> Honestly, when you look at some of those conditions, it's painful. I'll say all three of them. I'll say all three of them, but in a different order. You know, one of them was? One of them was this. He says, he calls the men of Banu Asad. He says, you know who I am? I'm the grandson of Rasulullah. Tomorrow when you see our bodies lying here, please bury us. They say, but Mola, why wouldn't we bury you? He says, that's not the case. Sometimes even a very honorable man, when pressure comes, or there's threat on his wife and children, in that situation, even he goes quiet. He says, just in case you go quiet, please bury us. But let me ask you something else. Can you call your women as well? You know what they say? Women in full hijab. They covered their faces. They covered their heads. All of them came to Sayyid al-Shuhada. You know what he says? He says, you know who I am? I'm the son of Zahra. If for ever reason your men feel embarrassed to come and bury us, why don't you come? You put dirt on our bodies and bury us. But after that, say the shuhada doesn't stop there either. He turns around and he says, can you ask your children to come? Small, small children come running. At that moment, Imam Hussein looks up. He says, have you seen my children? They realize, yeah, they're very beautiful. He says, you know that small four-year-old girl? He says, yes. You know, I'm the father of that Sakina. Children, if ever you see our bodies lying there and you notice that your mother and father are scared to bury us, as you play, just pick up some dirt and put it on our bodies. This is Karbala. As the days go on, you notice there's a person by the name of Hor. Just two things more about Hor. You know when Hur stops Imam Hussein? Hur, when he grabbed the horse of Imam Hussein and he began to say something to Imam Hussein, you know what Imam Hussein said to him? He said, Oh Sheikh, lay in kalamaka ya Sheikh, lower your tone, Sheikh. He said, looked up, he says, Why? He says, Zainab is here. <laughs> they say Hur had ghayra, Hur's heart stopped. Hur's heart stopped from it, took a step back. He was embarrassed. He had ghayra. Why? For whatever he had with Hussein, he knew Zainab was the daughter of Zahra. <laughs> they say when the ninth of Muharram came, Hur was walking very fast. Somebody seems him worried. They come up and they say, Hur, why are you so worried for? They're only 72. He says, I'm not worried about the fact that they're 72. I'm worried about their mother Zahra, what she's going to say. As they begin to walk, he begins to walk again. He sees someone coming. He says, oh person, where are you going? He says, I'm taking my horses to the Farad because they're thirsty. At that time, Hur begins to hit his head. He says, they're feeding their horses water. I can hear Zahra's granddaughter saying, Al-Atash, Al-Atash, thirst is killing us, father. <laughs> Hur does something. Hur turns around and he begins to walk. As he begins to walk, two people come to him. His son, his slave. Where are you going, father? He says, I'm going to Jannah. He says, where are we now, Father? We're in hell. We're going to Jannah. Where are you going? I'm going to Hussein. He says, Father, don't leave me as well. I want to come. His servant looks up. He says, Hor, I've served you for so many years. Take me as well now that you're going to Jannah. Hor says on one condition. He says, what is it? He says, tie my hands. He says, why? He says, because I feel embarrassed. I grabbed the horse of Hussein. 
He says another thing. He says, and also tie my eyes. He says, why? He says, because I looked at Hussein in Ghadab. Tie my hands, tie my, take me. At that moment, Karim ibn Karim, what does he say? <laughs> ibn Zahra, what does he say? He says, Abbas, Ali Akbar, go, my guest is coming. <laughs> Abbas and Ali Akbar begin to write. Hur is now coming. Hur's son turns around. He says, Abbas is coming. You know what he does? He chucks himself onto the floor. When he chucks himself, he says, Abbas, I'm not here to fight. Abbas says, nor am I here to fight as well. He says, I'm here to repent. He says, I'm here to hug you, or I'm here to take you to Hussein. <laughs> Abbas takes Hur to Hussein. You know what Hur does? He chucks himself onto the feet of Hussein. He says, Sayyid al-Shahada, forgive me, Hussein, forgive me. Forgive me, Hussein, please forgive me. What does Imam Hussein do? He hugs him, he says, Hur, I've forgiven you. He says, please, are you sure you've forgiven me? He says, of course, I'm, I've forgiven you. My mother Zahra has forgiven you. He says, Mola, then I want to do one more thing then. He says, Mola, I caused your pain. You know what Imam Hussein says, Hur, you're my guest. He says, I want to go into the battlefield. He says, Hur, but you're my guest. I wish I had water to give you. He says, Mola, don't talk about water anymore. <laughs> he says, I want to go into the battlefield. But I want to do one thing. That day when I raised my voice, I heard a sister crying. He says, I just want to go and repent. He says, he goes to the tent to say the Zainab, puts himself down. Picks up the dirt. He says, daughter of Zahra, forgive me. You know what she replies? Again, look whose daughter she is. She says, Hur, I forgive you. And Hur, on the day of judgment, when my mother Zahra comes, I'll intercede for you, Hur. <laughs> what does Hur turn around and say? Hur says, Sayyid al-Shahada, I want Imam Hussein. He says, I want my son to go into the battlefield first. Maybe when I die, my son may turn back. Look, I can't narrate everything, you know why? My heart can't take it. The only thing I'll say is this. What happens? All of a sudden, when a voice comes, her son falls to the ground. He says, Father, come and help me. As that son is fallen, they say, Father, old father chucks himself on the ground trying to come towards his son. As he gets there, what does he see? He sees another father was sitting there. He had his head, son's head on the shoulder. He was tick, hands on the son's shoulders, hands on the son's chest. At that moment, Hur says, he says, Hussein, why have you come to the body of my son? <laughs> Imam Hussein just says one thing, Hur, old father, young son, no old father should come. To the body of their son. Couple of hours later, as their time comes, an old father is saying, Ali, where are you? Ali?